Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today I am excited to be bringing you another special collaboration video, this time with artist Hajra Meeks. If you're not already familiar with Hajra, her artwork, or her YouTube channel, she is a lovely classical artist who loves golden age illustration, is a master of grisaille, is highly knowledgeable in gouache, metallic mediums, and her favorite Schmincke watercolors, and is also another spoonie like me. I'll of course leave all of her information in the description below and on the end card of this video so you can go ahead and check out her channel and her half of the collaboration after you watch this one. So I actually found Hajra's channel very early on in my watercolor journey. We weren't able to connect back then due to some life happenings that were going on, but more recently we were reintroduced here on YouTube, especially because we were both participants of Steve and Marty's live chat series over on the Mind of Watercolor throughout this year. We actually live fairly close to each other, although we haven't had a chance to meet up yet, but we didn't want that to hold us back from collaborating in the meantime. Hajra suggested the very thoughtful idea of the two of us using our own photographs that we had taken at various zoos as a reference for a spread in our own respective sketchbooks. She mentioned that she had photographs from the SF Zoo, as well as the Cal Academy of Sciences that she hadn't done much with, and that prompted me to take a look at all those pictures that I took back at the Denver Zoo in October of last year when I visited my sister in Colorado. So seriously, Denise, a year? Good grief, my goodness, okay. The Denver Zoo had a lot of really amazing highlights for me, including checking off two species from my bucket list, the Przewalski horses, which I've been obsessed with since I was a kid, and the African wild dogs that you recently saw in an Animal Arts Collective video. However, the exhibit that really struck me the most in terms of my photography was when we came across the cheetahs who had a really expansive enclosure, and we happened to walk by near sundown. The light was absolutely gorgeous, and I knew that I had about 2,700 give or take pictures from that exhibit alone. That's an exaggeration if you couldn't tell, but it was a lot of pictures, so I knew that that's what I wanted to focus on for this video. Going through so many pictures can be rather daunting, and the things that I look for as reference in watercolor are not always the same thing that I look for for my photography, so I can't always do them in the same pass. This screen recording is one that you are watching from my old Mac, which has an aperture library, and that's where all my pictures live. I like to go through all the pictures, mark my favorites with their star rating system that they have. Uh, it's available in this program, and it basically lets you set aside your favorites, although I'm sure that there are equivalent methods in other photo library type programs. But honestly, I've been out of the loop for so long with my photography that I have no idea what people are actually using these days. So I apologize if none of this is relevant. But anyway, after marking my favorites, I take a closer look at them side by side. I make minor edits like cropping and adjusting the values so that I can make sure I can see my whole subject. And then I check for the kind of pictures that look similar to each other so that I can narrow it down and not have like two versions of a picture that are facing to the side or two versions of a front on face. And that way I don't get overwhelmed when I'm going to sketch my artwork. For this project, I was specifically looking for images that showed off various angles, expressions, or head versus body shots so that I could make the most of this watercolor study, and after I finally picked all those, I was ready to move over to my art desk. Hajra also mentioned that she wanted to talk about her travel supplies in this video, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to revisit the topic here on this channel since I did a what's in my travel bag earlier this year. Since then, I've made a couple of small adjustments to my supplies, and I also wanted to let you guys know, those of you who are waiting for red panda bags or any of my other designs to come back in stock, they're now up on Etsy along with some brand new designs like this adorable baby little alligator print. Starting with my palette, this really changes day to day for me as I am lucky enough to have a lot of different ones available to me. This is the portable painter filled with mostly Daniel Smith paints and it's my go-to, although I also really love the Schmink Academy paints that I have and my White Knights for sketches as well. I'll list the portable painter and all the other supplies that I talk about in this video in the description below if you want to go ahead and find them for yourself. Next up are my Pentel Aquash brushes, and these are a travel essential for me. Here I have the medium and large brushes, but I really cannot see myself leaving the house with my art supplies without these with them. I have a video explaining more about water brushes if you want to go ahead and see a bit more information on that. I'll put an iCard in the link above. 
I of course always want to have some kind of sketching tool with me as well, and these are my mechanical Pilot Eno colored pencils. They are nice for getting details in sketches, but do be aware that the lead is water soluble. Uh, so just be aware of that if you're trying to use them with watercolors. I always make sure to carry a few different options with me so that I have colors that match my subject for when the water inevitably, inevitably picks up the pigment. I also have a hard and a soft graphite pencil as well as two earth tone polychromos colored pencils that I like to keep close at hand. For the occasional times that I want to add line art or do an ink sketch, I have both the black and brown micron fine liners with me as well as a white Signo gel pen. However, I did realize later in this video that it pretty much had dried up. Along with my Pentel Aquash, another favorite, favorite supply of mine are these dust-free Faber-Castell erasers. Finally, I have my sketchbook. I've used a variety of sketchbooks in the past. I just finished up my travelog sketchbook, and this one is from Hanamula. Regardless of what brand, I really like the 8 by 5 inch size because they fit really nicely inside of my travel bags. Here, just to kind of show you the quality of this sketchbook, I have a few paintings that I've made over the last couple of months, and all of these paintings are available over on Patreon in one form or another, whether it's a real-time tutorial or a live stream. Finally, we can move on to our sketches. I've gone ahead and put up my reference photos next to their respective sketches so that hopefully you can follow along with the process a little bit better, although I don't have every little minute of this footage included because we'd be here for hours when all was said and done, but I would like to share a little bit of my experience with sketching with you guys. My patrons have already heard me talk about this, so I apologize to them that this might be a repeat subject, but I think it's something I talk about a little bit less here on the channel. I've been drawing my entire life in some capacity or another, although it's not my strongest skill. Even though I've been painting for much less time, it actually comes more naturally to me than drawing does. I feel like it's extremely important to be able to self-identify our own strengths and weaknesses in life in general, but specifically in art in this case. Especially in watercolor with a transparent medium, we cannot really change where things are going to be down on the paper once we've already started to paint. There's little tricks that we can do here or there, which Steve over on the Mind of Watercolor just posted a video about, so that was timely, and be sure to go ahead and check that out. But basically, if our foundation isn't there, if those sketch lines aren't there, if it's not as strong as we know that it could be, when we start to paint, it might not ever look the way we want it to. My point in all this is that when I first started off painting, my paintings would often look just off or wrong or, you know, I wasn't really sure what was going on. And at first I thought that that meant I needed to improve my painting techniques. Well, I'm always trying to improve my painting or drawing or whatever techniques, but specifically in these cases, looking back in hindsight, nearly every one of my quote failed attempts was due to my drawing skills more so than my painting skills. As I mentioned before, I've been drawing all my life, but it's not something that I went to school for or took a lot of classes in. It wasn't until I had the opportunity to attend a lecture here in the Bay Area from John Muir Laws, who I will link in the description below because you guys always ask for it when I mention him. And in this lecture that I attended, I think it was my first one with him, he went over how to sketch using a variety of tools, and they were all things that I was aware of but hadn't kind of accumulated them into this method that he he uses for drawing and really that's when everything changed. It really clicked for me and from that point on I started to enjoy sketching instead of it being a chore that I had to do to get to watercolors. I did do a video on this a while back for my patrons but John also has his recordings from his live lectures up on his own YouTube channel so I recommend watching that as well if you are interested and if you are ever in the Bay Area and have a chance to attend one of his monthly Nature Journal Club meetings do it. They are absolutely wonderful. They are donation based and they happen in seven different locations all around the Bay. I swear none of these plugs that I've been giving in this video for other resources or paid endorsements or anything. I just really strongly believe in them. So if they're there, go ahead and use them. Okay, so now we've moved on to our paintings. One of my favorite things about making these big sketchbook spreads is that with four or five sketches on a page, you can actually move through them, allowing one sketch to dry while working on the next. 
In these first clips, you're going to see me working from left to right, laying down the initial washes on all of the sketches, but leaving the details for later stages. It's kind of fun to see that these base coats for the cheetahs without their spots look kind of similar to mountain lions because of their coloration, but it also lets you to help train your brain to start seeing what separates a mountain lion from a cheetah besides just the spots, and then you'll start to notice other structural differences. When you're painting animals, it really helps to train your brain to automatically start looking for these differences during your sketching phase rather than in the painting stage so that you can strengthen those foundational lines that we've already talked about. As we move through the various sketches, you might also notice a difference in my technique and how I use a water brush differently from a traditional brush. The first thing is that the synthetic fibers in a water brush can take a lot more abuse than any one of my traditional brushes, even the synthetic ones that are trying to mimic other types of hair. I use them to pull water across the page and even to push the paint out of certain areas. The slow but constant feed of water allows me to cover large areas with this really loose painterly flow. And the only time that I have to stop working between the palette and the paper is when I occasionally need to wipe off a little extra paint or water on a towel. As I go in for the second pass, I'll be adding a lot more depth to the sketches, particularly in relation to the values and the details themselves. However, I always take care to remind myself that this is still a sketchbook. It's for sketches and not everything in here has to be a perfect painting. I used to be afraid of sketchbooks, thinking that they had to look like Instagram perfect or they weren't worth doing, or I would avoid them thinking that they were a waste of time because why sketch when I could be working on something that I could sell as a working artist? And personally, that mindset grew to be so toxic for me. I no longer painted for fun. I painted because I had to, and because I had to, it better had been worth my time. Super awesome happy time, right? Well, being able to adopt this new mindset has really allowed me to try new techniques without worrying too much about the outcome and to have fun with the art instead of being stressed out about how it will turn out. It took a while for me to get here, but now I am all about learning and playing in my sketchbooks, and that is absolutely worth my time. I have a totally different, positive relationship with my sketchbooks, and I couldn't be happier about that.
as for the rest of this video, I do want to apologize as lo and behold, my computer ate three of my video files and not just any three of the video files, the three files in which I was painting all of the cheetah's spots because why wouldn't my computer try and sabotage my video of a cat? That is pretty much characteristically defined by its spots. Well, silly computer, I guess we can forgive it just this one time, but I hope that the other information in this video has proven to be useful for you. I think the only other thing that I really wanted to make sure I mentioned in this video is that the only supply that I'm using in these sketches that I did not show you at the beginning of this video is my white ink. And that is only because I had realized that that white Signo gel pen had dried up and it wasn't working properly, which you'll see me struggle with a little bit. And uh, so I switched over to my white ink, but this is not actually out of character for what I do with my travel sketchbooks. Um, oftentimes I will find that my white gel pens are not working as they should and so I will bring home my sketchbook and do the highlights at my studio desk after I've done everything else just to kind of polish them off. So I did want to make mention of that but otherwise I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that some of the information I talked about about sketchbooks or about the drawing process were helpful. I hope that you'll check out some of those other resources that I mentioned and make sure you check out Hajra's video. I'm really excited. I haven't seen her video yet. All I know is that she's going to be working on some birds, which I have found recently that I absolutely love painting as well. So hop on over to her channel, give her video some love, and uh, I think that'll about do it. You guys know the drill by now. I'm just gonna have some nice calm music playing for the rest of the video and you can hang out with me and my sketchbook. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Let me know in the comments below how you use your sketchbook. And as always, thank you so much to my patrons for helping make this channel possible. I will see you in the next video and until then, happy painting. <laughs>